trends that we've, we've seen uh, today clearly are, in my estimation at least, uh, are born out, have been born out of a racism that is particularly directed towards Muslims today. You can see the BNP, for example, will, will give the mantra that not all Muslims are terrorists, all terrorists are Muslims. Um, they will say things like today uh, that they wouldn't have said in the past, that the problem is we, we can accept all of the other groups and individuals even though they can't, um, but the Muslims really are a problem. And that sort of resonates quite clearly with what happened with the, uh, the Jews of Nazi Germany. What's behind it, I think, is not just one single thing. I think uh, if you look at what's taking place in Iraq and Afghanistan, and say, working towards Iran and so forth, clearly, in my estimation, again, I think that is there is a, a, a desire to grab the resources of that land and to be greatly influential. What they come across there, and, and this is something that people have talk, spoken about in the past in great detail, people like Tony Blair, is once you take that position, you've forgotten the world in which you're dealing with. Because that's the Muslim world, and the Muslims, regardless of whether you like it or not, see them as part, see themselves as part of a of a nation, as an ummah, as a word in the Quran that's used quite often, and they have ignited a sense of solidarity between Muslims in a way that never perhaps existed before. And part of that reaction that we've seen uh, then says that this is a, uh, um, at least in the Muslim world, it's greatly seen like this, that this is a war against Muslims. And therefore, that's fed into the clash of civilizations theory. Not that I necessarily believe it, but that certainly seems to be what a lot of people on the ground are advocating, including, for example, when I was held in the background detention facility, every single um, cage had a title on it. One was called the USS Cole, one was called the Twin Towers, you can understand those. But then you saw others, Iraq, uh, then you saw um, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, and the common denominators seem to be for the average American soldier that every time it happens to be a Muslim place or country or individual. What's more important, though, it seems to me, is what you can identify as a kind of institutionalized racism, it, particularly in some newsrooms. So again, the Daily Mail, I haven't come across this before in terms of Fleet Street gossip, but I think it's true to say that just about every reporter I spoke to who has worked for the Daily Mail had some story about, had an example of being sent out on a story and then having that story vetted by news desk people from a clearly racist point of view. And there's a key phrase they use. So the reporter's out on the story. It might be a murder, somebody's dead. And the reporter calls in to say what the story is. And the news desk executive says either, are they one of us or are they of the dusky hue? And what this, what this means, we don't want the stories about ethnic minorities in our paper, unless they fit within a very narrow template. The Daily Mail has a certain kind of ethnic minority person who it approves of. So the example I was given was there was a black soldier who just won, I think it was the George Cross in Iraq. Well, he's one of us. But generally speaking, you have this extraordinary and explicit filter against stories which simply reflect the ordinary lives of ordinary people who happen to belong to ethnic minorities. And that's perfectly clear and explicit. That expression, are they of the dusky hue, is one that's used by one particular executive. And after a while, I've heard it several times, I started mentioning it to other male people, and they said, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. So I can't imagine that the most senior people, the editor, doesn't realise that that's what's going on on the paper. And that's institutionalised, isn't it? That's there. And if you ask why, it isn't because the individual journalists are racist. It's something deeper, it's a commercial thing. They realise that that lower middle class readership, which the Daily Mail is going for, has a basic sort of racist presumption in its view of the world. And for commercial reasons, it's feeding it. And by doing that, it's reinforcing it. Because every time you, I don't, can I say one other thing? I did this analysis of photographs that appear in the Daily Mail, where we said, first of all, how many of these are of white people and how many of ethnic minorities? And then having, those numbers show roughly in proportion to the population as a whole. And then we said, how many of the people in the photographs, white or black, could be broadly described as bad? Notably, for example, people of pictures, pictures of people who've broken the law. And in the case of pictures of ethnic minority, it was something like 60 or 70 percent, it's in the book, were of people who'd broken the law. I mean, way out of proportion to the reality. So that selective filter ends up reinforcing the racism that's already there in the readers and actually encouraging it. Do you see what I'm saying? So, that, I think, is quite worrying. And there would be other newspapers, I think, where you would find the same thing. The, the ideology 
of a, a Islamophobia, which lies behind Islamophobia, does exist, and it is advocated and sometimes explicitly by very, very partial people. I mean, the most obvious example, it seems to me, is a, a remarkable speech by Tony Blair in 2006, maybe 2005, I forget which, uh, in Los Angeles, when he was uh, en route uh, a, to I mean, pay tribute to the uh, court of Rupert Murdoch, sort of in an island of Canada. So he stopped off in uh, Los Angeles, he made a very remarkable speech, uh, which he confessed he had spent three weeks writing. And in that speech, he, that if he wanted to explain to people, so that there was no doubt about it, why he had supported uh, the invasion of Iraq. And he said, remarkably, he says it wasn't about weapons of mass destruction. He says it wasn't about regime, regime change either. He says it was because they were fighting a war, a war against what he called reactionary Islam, and the capital R in the script for reactionary Islam to make it clear that this was a phenomenon and not just a general description. But, and he said that they had to support moderate, modern Islam, again, initial caps, against the reactionary Islam. Now, it was a clear statement that he was fighting, he was intervening in what he saw as a split within Islam. And it struck me at the time, it, one of the things that struck me is that this speech got scarcely any coverage in uh, the British media, even though it, I believe it was the single most significant and certainly the clearest exposition by Blair of why he had supported the, um, taken part in the invasion, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 invasion of Iraq. But what really struck me about it is, that isn't he just saying what Mr. Bin Laden says? He says that the West is involved in a war against what Bin Laden would regard as authentic Islam. You know, in support of reactionaries like the ruling class in Saudi Arabia and so on, it absolutely matched and complemented that, uh, that view. So there is that sort of ideological shape to the argument, and no doubt that is influential at all sorts of levels. But I agree with Nick that, it, 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 that to look beyond that and to try to identify people who are either controlling or having a destructive influence on the way the media covers things in some powerful and conspiratorial way is, I think, to miss, miss the point that I agree sort of, with Nick, is that these things happen in a much more subtle and unstated, sort of, a, a, a almost indefinable way. First of all, if you take the expression of war on terror, um, uh, it's the use of the word terror from the journalist's point of view is the first uh, dodgy word, because uh, that is a highly ideological decision to apply that word to some areas of political violence and not to others. And once that's adopted in the mainstream of language, it becomes a very subtle way in which the ideology sneaks into the way that the world is reported. So that's the first thing. And I'm not sure that that has anything to do with the, the status, criminal, military, political or other, of people who've been detained. And it seems to me that what will decide the future of those people in Guantanamo, this is a story, but a question for Mosul, really, is, is politics, whether or not there's sufficient political pressure put on Washington, D.C. to change track. Personally, you may want to disagree with me, maybe you'll be... I have very, 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 very little faith in Barack Obama. At the moment, it seems to me that yet another shameful example of media failure is the, is the myth-making, the elevation of Obama to some kind of political messiah, the absolute failure to ask basic questions about what it is he is saying. What, what is this man's policy? And uh, within that, the idea that because the United States has elected a black man, that's the end of racism in the United States. <laughs> It's just ludicrous. Did, did sexism in Britain when Thatcher was elected? It does. You know, that's not the end of the case. It really isn't. Sorry, I'm beginning to ramble away from your question. But it just seems to me that the, the, the two things, the language and the, the future of those detainees, isn't particularly obviously linked to me. You're going to have much more about this. Um, I, I completely agree. I think uh, the reality is, of course, that when you've said, when, when you've taken this position, what's going to happen to those detainees, we were given a status that has no precedent in the United States of America, or in the laws of war, and that is enemy combat, and I still am one. And uh, my book says so, by the way. In all honesty, as far as that's concerned, people may be, and they're, they're talking about in the United States of America, having more new laws, a new system, in order to deal with these people, as if the system that they have already is not adequate, as if there's never been any terrorism in the United States of America, as if there is not a, a huge gun lobby in the United States of America, people don't have bombs and bullets that they uh, like to use there. So I think this this idea of trying to rewrite the book when it comes to the issues on, on, on terrorism, and the very word of course, I think it's, it's really important like was said earlier on, where did terrorism come from in the English language? The first use of the word terrorism in the English language was from uh, the revolution in France. It was brought then into this country because the, the people, the elites in power believed that that sort of thing was quite, quite terrifying for them 
if we change how the uh, structure is set up. So terrorism is very relative, and it's always been relative. The, the Mujahideen today, who are called terrorists during the time of the 70s and the 80s in the occupation of Afghanistan, were called Mujahideen. See Rambo Three for, for more evidence. <laughs> Uh, so, the status of all of these things, and people, even people who've been convicted in this country, uh, we can. I remember speaking to a lot of prisoners uh, from Northern Ireland who said, who were the first ones to say to me that although we had internment, the laws at the time didn't have people convicted for downloading stuff on the internet or reading books or writing poetry, which is precisely the sort of thing that's happening today. Uh, people have been convicted for for thought crimes for. Uh, Immense rear before they ever even imagined or planned to do the act. People were detained in Guantanamo Bay and in the secret detention, detention sites for the most part, not because they did something, because they could be neutralized in order they don't do anything in the future because they fit a certain profile. So until that changes, uh, whether they close Guantanamo or not is, is, will be just academic. Uh, the secret detentions program will, I think, still continue because the CIA is not going to stop and change their policy. So if you just remind me, also, uh, a question also asked about the, fight, the economic crisis and, and whether that would, uh, how that would affect um, portrayals of, of what well, was Islamophobia in the media and so whether it's going to get worse. And also whether we have a good working description of what war is and what function war has within um, <coughs> capitalism. I don't know if anyone wants to address that as well, but you also asked about that. Amy, do you have any on that, I suppose, uh, I think the status of uh, people detained without trial under uh, so-called anti-terror legislation, the future status will depend entirely on the extent to which uh, we succeed in uh, campaign to have them released unconditionally and return to the families as they ought to be, since they've not been convicted or, in most cases, even charged with any crime, then their status will be citizen. If we don't uh, succeed uh, in that campaign, then their status will be of people in prison, or whatever word you use. Uh, actively to uh, describe it. In relation to uh, uh, the uh, financial crisis, or uh, what it means sir, for reporting and so forth, uh, of uh, the so called war on terror and everything associated with it, uh, the way I see it is that I, I think that the financial crisis affects the media generally, uh, it affects reporting. And, uh, and changes sort of in the financial context sort of in which newspapers exist and uh, have to sell newspapers and so on are also very important. What I'm getting at, just to cut it short, is this that uh, uh, I'm the chairman of my local branch of the NUJ, where I'm somebody involved in trying to recruit people in newspapers, and there's been a great proliferation of local newspapers in Ireland, and I imagine sort of on this side of the uh, ABC as well, that because the marginal costs of producing an extra newspaper, an extra title night are very, very little. The cost of paper and ink, really, sort of is all the case. You've got lots of these little newspapers popping up, sort of, and uh, typically now, uh, people are recruited into journalism, not in the way that they used to be when I were a lad. Uh, uh, you know, when you got a job, sort of, in your local newspaper, and you did reasonably well, sort of, and if you were terribly ambitious to go to Fleet Street, you might make it, sort of, and get a job. But it's a career path. You know, and you learn certain things, I mean, by going to courts and so on, about how to get the facts right and spell names right, and obviously at the age of uh, the person you are. Very important that, you know, you come up 24. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and you'd be sent back together if you didn't have it in your pocket. You know, I mean, so, you know, and then, so you moved on. Now, now, what happens is that people get six month contracts, typically, or maybe a year contract. They're in there on sufferance. They can be got rid of after a year. It's, they can't afford to cause any trouble. They can't for I was in the same place just yesterday evening. I had a meeting sort of with three young people from just called the Dairy News. The reason I thought only one of them was a member of the union, but as we all know, when people get into trouble, they wouldn't join unions last week. That's a bit of trouble, and they're on the phone, you know. I want to join the union. Right? Okay. And I, uh, uh, that, when they came along, what sparked them to come along is that one of the journalists had been told that she would have to fill in for about three days a week at lunch times on the reception desk. Uh, in the newspaper, you know, and she had done it for a couple of days, and other people were saying, rather than a rather snobby way, oh, the journalist is not supposed to do that, and so on. So when I gave her the form and so on, and she said, look, you have to promise not to ask me to strike. Uh, and then she said, because if I start talking about striking in there, I'd be sad, they won't renew my contract. Now there is a job, how do you fight for journalistic ethics there? How do you fight, how do you encourage that young woman? That, I mean, that I'm a reasonable person, I can understand exactly what she was saying, that it would be unreasonable to expect her to take a stand for journalistic ethics and the integrity uh, of the trade and the rest of it. Now spread that out, sir, right? There's no job insecurity in our trade. 
sort of at any time at my lifetime. That has a big effect, and that is because of the changing nature of the technology, sort of which makes the, the, the process of producing newspapers is different. But the fragmentation, again, because of the new technology uh, introduced, the fragmentation sort of of different jobs within newspapers. So people spend a lot of time just sitting sort of at their own workstation from morning to night, working, and they don't have much interaction, they don't have interaction with subs anymore the way they used to have, and one person's checking and others. There isn't that sense of communality uh, anymore in, in newspapers, or even in sort of in national newspapers in Ireland, they know more about them than I know in Britain. All that affects the way journalists see themselves. All that affects the level of self-confidence that they might have in standing up for what is right and what is true and what is objective in journalism. So in that way, you're absolutely right. To try and fight for freedom of speech sort of, and integrity Sort of, uh, in journalism, to try to do that without, at the same time, taking on sort of the economic structures and changing the economic structures that they, uh, exist within is really to miss the point. Um, Eamon and I were both at the Marxism conference in Dublin last weekend, and there was a discussion there about how it is that ideology comes into newspapers. Because from the outside, it must look as though there is an explicit conspiracy by the power elite to ensure that newspapers always report, report from the point of view of the rich and powerful. As it is that conspiracy isn't there, there are these other rather subtle forces in play. And one of the ones which seems to me important in, in answering the question, right, why is the ideology always from that position, is, is to look at newspapers structurally and to see the way in which over the decades uh, the corporate owners of the press, I've probably said this to some of you before, but we, we, our staffing levels have been reduced rather importantly our output has been increased. Therefore, we spend far much more time sitting, passively recycling second-hand information. And what that very frequently means is public relations. So we did this analysis where we found that 54% of the home news stories published by the quality press in this country were constructed. The material was supplied by the PR industry. Now, PR is expensive. Rich people have it, poor people don't. Governments have it, corporations do have it. And, uh, it, it, I mean, so for example, if we look at the Islamophobia, one of the most frightening examples of the media soaking up and reproducing Islamophobic stories was in the Forest Gate raid. The cops go into a house, they start shooting people, innocent people, unarmed people are injured. Indeed, they, they busted into the wrong house, essentially. Do you remember the stories that were produced then about how the guys who lived in that house were um, storing cash for terrorist operations and had devised some kind of very clever suit which enabled them to carry, I think it was chemical weapons around London. It was extraordinary stuff. That is PR briefing from the Metropolitan Police, a powerful organisation that has a large and powerful press office. And reporters sit there on the phone, you're giving me a story, that's fine. And the guys that are on the other end of the story, so to speak, have been arrested. Or they may have family people out on the pavement waving placard, but they haven't got the machinery or the credibility to inject their line into the media. Right? And what I'm trying to say that connects with what you're saying is, that the more that the financial crisis robs newspapers of its advertising income, the weaker they become, the more vulnerable they become to PR injection from the politicians and the big corporations. So that 54% figure, I suspect, will rise. And you will see more and more clearly that ideology. There are other factors in there, but that's a big structural thing. That in, that in principle, the same skills which are used by very expensive PR agencies can be used by anybody. So as a kind of example of that, if you look at the uh, reporting of climate change, there have been two slightly different corporate camps using very powerful PR people to put their slightly different angles on the issue. And you did also have the likes of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth very successfully manipulating media coverage in order to get their angle across. And if you regard, I think you could say in that context, Greenpeace is a dissident voice. They understand how to play the media. They play that game. So it's, but this is the thing. It, it, you kind of have to hold your nose to do it. Because it does involve taking what you would regard as the truth and translating it into the kind of shape that the media will accept. And again, it isn't to do with the political conspiracy against you. It's to do, I think, with the internal logic of a very commercialized media. So they don't like abstract ideas. They want human. They want concrete. They don't like history. They like now. They like things that have got pictures with them. They like things that have got glamour. They like things that have got celebrities. And there comes a kind of point there where you might think, ah, I can't bear to do it. And in fact, the process is very frequently inherently distorting, right? PR does inherently distort its information in order to fit it into these templates that the media like. But if you can do that without crossing a line where you think this is actually not worth it, this is actually just morally disgusting, 
then in principle, you are definitely right. The media is whorish and will go after good stories and can be led. I said, it, you, you know, um, uh, Marshall McLuhan we talked about the, the global village, and I said the media more and more is like this global village idiot that's just led along wherever the PR industry takes it. And, and in that principle, we believe it too. I'm going to expose you, even though you look uh, a little incognito. But this is Hisham Yeza, and he was uh, arrested uh, by the uh, police in Nottingham for uh, downloading something from a, a United States Defense Department uh, website, and it was the Al Qaeda manual, which was part of his research. So you may have heard of this case. And, and I think that that demonstrates so directly the uh, effects of government directives towards people who are part of academia and telling them how they should be, for all intents and purposes, running a police state for them. Uh, recently we heard of a government toolkit where they said that children as young as five years old upwards uh, should be identified by their teachers for um, possible radicalization. This is the sort of state that we're in right now. This is unprecedented. This didn't even happen at the height of the troubles that happened when, at the time when, or when 10 Downing Street was hit, or that the, the MI5 was built, the building was, was struck, or that uh, Lord Mountbatten was taken out. It, was, it has no precedent in this country. It is truly unique to, to be walking into this way backwards. And I think the only way to do this, the only way to deal with your question in, in my estimation, is to expose it for the ludicrous nature in which it has been uh, carried out. The, if, and one of the worst things that happened, of course, in Hisham's case, was that uh, there was a great deal of support from all of the students, one of the most active student bodies I've ever seen in terms of uh, campaigning for him. But there was very, very little or no support from the academic teachers themselves, from the lecturers themselves, coming out and saying, this is not our job to spy wrongfully afterwards, uh, after all, because once they've detained him, they've realized that this really was his research, he wasn't part of Al-Qaeda, and this was something that, that would stifle any sort of academic um, curiosity, as he said, as he said uh, in, in the university. So these sorts of things need to be exposed, and people need to be told that if you're part of, a, of this tradition that says that Britain has a, a open doors towards academia, then why was this man? And why is this, more importantly, why is this attitude allowed to perpetuate? I, I think one of the problems uh, a, with a, our third level education in particular is this, that uh, it, it, universities are now no longer centres of learning, or at least they're not centres of learning in the way that they used to be, sort of from the grand old sepia tinted days, you know, that, uh, when, you know, old professors with chalk dust and their sort of unkempt hair are you know, leading little groups of students towards idealism and, uh, and all that. I mean, universities now sort of run by accountants. Uh, they make small businesses, uh, or even medium-sized uh, businesses, and more and more openly, spokespersons for universities will talk about the way in which they serve as industry, rather than the way in which they are encouraging the development of rounded human beings with a conscientious and inquiring sort of uh, attitude uh, a, a to the world. And uh, I think as long as that, while that, is, that trend continues and the, 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 the trend is not, hasn't drawn its course yet, you know, I mean, eventually, uh, I mean, we are going to have not just, I mean, the court hall's chair, sort of, of this or that, we're actually going to have universities which are simply set up, sort of, by industry and by big business to supply the skilled workforce that they calculate according to their business plans for the future that they're going to need in five or ten years' time. And the whole idea, sort of, of open-minded investigation and of research is fast disappearing. Uh, you know, they, 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 I think there's an absolute decline sort of in the standard of undergraduate teaching. There certainly is in Ireland, and I think it would, my impression is that there certainly is in this side of the world as well. And they, they, they look at league tables for every stage of the educational system now. No one, they, they, there was a headline in the Irish Times on the front page uh, some weeks ago which announced that Trinity College Dublin was the 17th best university in the world. And this was great success because previously it had been something 25th that got off the league table. It's so, like, well, how did they measure that? I mean, how can everything be measured that? But you ask people, they say, well, you know, they, they tick boxes, they fill up, you set sort of uh, a, 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 the expectations, we set benchmarks, and then you tick boxes and see if they have been reached, sort of, and so on. There are many feet of men. What has that got to do? The nature of things, I mean, education can't be measured in that way. It can't be. Sort of, uh, as, uh, again, as long as that's the case. 
you're not, it's going to be very difficult actually to be sort of a, a proper researcher, real researching for the truth, or to get sort of full hearted support. I gather you got it, sort of, as well as I've said, that's a very good, but very difficult to mobilize students or academic staff around that. You, you've got some newspapers who undoubtedly perceive their readers as being racist <coughs> and for commercial reasons are feeding those prejudices and reinforcing and exaggerating them. But you get other newspapers that aren't doing that. I, I'm not sure which hot headlines you've been talking about during the day. I mean, the worst of them you're going to find in the Mail and the Sun, aren't you? That's right. Uh, yeah? Right. <clears throat> and, yeah. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, you, you were talking about the, the hugeness of it. It is, it is kind of parallel in lots of ways. The, uh, the fight against the Islamic terrorists and their fight against communism, they do have a lot of common features. It's global, it involves the media, it involves uh, unmitigated and untargeted violence. Uh, there's, a level of, there's a level that runs through of brutal incompetence as well, as well as your kind of conspiracy factors. Like, for example, if you take this guy, I mean, the government has poured resources and legal power into all the machinery of hunting down capturing the bad guys. And they don't actually know where these bad guys are. So they go and pick up good guys. He's not the only example. Do you remember the people, for example, who were arrested in Manchester because they were going to blow up the old Trafford um, football ground? And, and this was a piece of fiction, absolute bullshit. And they spent days in custody, being interrogated, and finally had to be released. Well, all, all of those resources that are going into chasing innocent people in theory, are supposed to be there to protect us from the bad guys. You can see, it is a kind of brutal incompetence, and it's there. Did you mention Guatemala? I, I've been there, and it was just, I mean, disgusting, disgusting. The massacre of people organized by the dictatorship that was in turn being instructed by the Americans. Just vile, and absolutely nothing to do with protecting anybody against anything. Just, there's a, there's, there, do you not understand what I'm talking about? There's a, it, it, you, there is a conspiracy there at a certain level, or a plan. And then it just becomes absolutely out of control, and idiots in the media and everybody else join in and recite the same mantras. The, the, the main reason why journalists don't tell the truth is that they've got no fucking idea what it is. Right. <laughs> start, and then they get misinformed. Right. Back along before the invasion, they got stuck into a narrative heavily reliant on government PR, which was that we had to go and get the bad guy. Right. We stumble in, a whole lot of people start dying. The media then did something which they are capable of doing, which was that they changed narrative. And I would say that they then got into this. It's a disaster, right? And uh, they, they, they're in that narrative still. This is probably going to irritate you, but it is arguable that that narrative is now spent and that they should have changed direction again. The Americans have done something out there on the ground that, has, as far as I can tell, an ignorant journalist sitting at home, has lowered the level of killing. I don't know whether it was the surge or something to do with buying groups to form a lie. I don't know what they've done on the ground because the media aren't reporting it because they're stuck in the it's a disaster narrative. And actually that matters because to the extent that we wanted them to stop, it would be very helpful if we understood why some of that killing stopped, but the media has stopped. So I, I disagree with your basic assumption where you're saying, what does it take to get the media to, to accept that Iraq is a disaster? I think they're, they're stuck in phase two of the narrative and haven't moved on to phase three. Uh, sorry, you want to? Um, you want to uh, so, you were asking about what lessons from the Irish experience uh, it could be learned. Uh, the lessons that I would draw are really not lessons for us, if you like. I could draw lessons for us as well, but I mean, they just on the time available. But lessons for the people who are implementing these uh, repressive measures and curtailing uh, a freedom of speech and freedom uh, of the media. So the, the lesson I think that should be borne in on is that it doesn't work. You know, it's, uh, and I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that people like Blair in particular, and also Brennan, a whole lot of them, I mean, they're so uncurious, they're intellectually inert, they're ignorant of history, and show no desire to know about history. And if they studied the Irish experience in the 1970s and the 1980s, where you had sort of, there's a quite draconian uh, laws with curtailing uh, in the media, for example, it was illegal to put a member of Sinn Féin and the IRA or the IRA's National Republican Socialist Party and others on radio or television. And it didn't work for a whole variety of it. One of the reasons it didn't work at all is it had newspapers, sorry, television companies, and they had to hire actors, I mean, to 
mouth the words of people like Jerry Adams, and I think he did Jerry Adams a lot of good for about like four years. He was using Stephen Ray's voice. That's how the lift me was You know, people say, I don't remember that voice, you're a trustworthy guy. And also, I mean, they had him turn up without trial, of course, and people were in for years and years. I mean, I'm friends with Sean Keenan, who had a number of them, turned up exactly, served 12 and a half years in prison, was never charged with an offence in his life, and he did 12 and a half years uh, overall. And that's pretty draconian. Did it work? Absolutely not. Because the longer they kept at it, sort of uh, repressing people, the more sort of uh, the, the friends and associates and neighbours and communities from which those people came were outraged. And the more likely they were, this is the historical record, the more likely they were I mean, to bunch themselves outside the constitutional consensus and into tacit support for, if not active involvement in, the very movements that these draconian measures were supposed to uh, end. But it, it, it come up with it, that it could be, but I hope The other thing I would say is this, that all those laws are gone now, and they were defeated. Again, you say, okay, very honourable role, sort of fighting against those. I, I'm not an uncritical admirer of the NUJ's record over the years, but certainly in that particular instance, uh, it played a very good role. See, these laws are, those laws are gone, but let me tell you very briefly, if they've stopped me, but not too long, Becky, it's, it's, I was involved in this Raytheon 9 business where we smashed up an arms company uh, in 2006 and protested against its involvement in arming the Israeli Defence Forces during uh, mm -hmm. the conflict uh, in Lebanon. And in the course of that, there was a ban on reporting of the case imposed by the judge. And the man was very wide ranging. The man said that no mention could be made sort of, of anybody associated with this case. No mention of them at all. And that was deemed to include the Raytheon Company. So that no mention could be made of the Raytheon Company, good, bad, or indifferent, sort of, in uh, the media. I meant, for example, when Raytheon announced that they were taking on 20 new workers in Derry. They never actually took them on at the end of the day, but anyway. So sort of, they announced that they were having 20 new workers. You know, they go off their workforce, they go off from about 40 up to 60. When local newspapers phoned the courts, this can't be reported, no. That had done work. That is utterly ridiculous. And one of the points that sort of making, sort of, is that that in some ways sort of was a more draconian sort of a war that you couldn't report anything, even in the darkest days of Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act in the South and so forth. He sort of couldn't report what was going on, even if he couldn't put on numbers of particular organizations eh, to react to it. But see, the laws have gone. You know, but still the practice can continue in other guys, uh, other guises. So the point that I'm making is not just sort of the formal content of a piece of legislation which matters. It's in the atmosphere, sort of a, a custom and practice, and it's the way in which these things are received and whether they are fought against. So on the impact of the Hutton inquiry on the BBC, I teach in the BBC, and there is no doubt that particularly in the outlying regions of the B, that had a huge chilling effect. And management were very, very cautious about running any kind of story which would cause any kind of trouble. At the centre, th th there's still people in, in Panorama, for example, who are allowed to cause trouble, although Panorama is careering downhill with its commercial agenda. But it, it, did, it did have a terrifying effect. I wouldn't want to write off the BBC. There's a culture of honesty in that place. They may not get it right all the time, but there is a culture of honesty. It makes a great deal of difference if that's not owned by a corporation. It belongs to a trust. And that does mean that all this insidious commercial influence is somewhat mitigated. So I wouldn't want to write it off just because Hutton's made life more difficult there. And then the other thing is kind of about fighting back and what we do about disgusting stories like that in the sun and disgusting people like Tony Parsons. <laughs> Part of the problem is that there is no avenue of redress. Like if your doctor gives you a bad treatment, you can go to the, to the General Medical Council and get him struck off. All we have to deal with the media is the Press Complaints Commission, a genuinely corrupt organisation. Uh, an organisation which uh, any journalist with any self-respect is embarrassed to have anything to do with them. Uh, so th the first thing we should do is to carry on denouncing them in the strongest possible language. Um, the second is that somewhere we just need to find a millionaire or, or a very wealthy trade union, somebody to sponsor our own PCC. We have our own watchdog and dig out all these damned examples of them flagrantly, blatantly getting stuff wrong and publicise it. And, and maybe hit them, these organisations in their most sensitive parts, which are their wallets, by, by exposing the extent of their falsehood to drive some of their readers and viewers and listeners away from them. I finished now. <laughs> so if anyone's got a few spare million quick, come and see us afterwards. Yeah. Hey. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just that we do have potentially, you know, we've got the bones of a, a PCC of our own, it's the National Union of Journalists. <coughs> you know, uh, if you haven't been the NUJ long enough uh, to remember, it should be Rule 42, it's not what it was uh, 30 <laughs> years ago. 24, man. Now 24, <laughs> Rule 24. This is one where people behave badly. 
and also the, 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 they broke the code of uh, conduct or the, or the act in sort of uh, bullying or unacceptable way towards fellow journalists and making them do things that they didn't want to do and so forth. You could take this charge against them in union rules. And believe it or not, people used to be terrified. You know, being brought up under Rule 42, you know, where a committee would be appointed and so forth, and all sorts of sanctions. You know, of course, it only works if you're very strong and active uh, union organisation, because you want to close shops are broken, sort of, if you take the ultimate sanction is to throw somebody out of the union. Well, I mean, if they're able to shrug their shoulders and say, well, there's only about 30% of the people here in the union, I don't see if I care. So then the, the, the union loses the part to do that. And so that the, uh, within the media, so it's the strength of workers' organization, sort of, which gives you at least the potential, actually, to oppose sort of, uh, some ethics on uh, a, a, a journalist. Mick made the point in Dublin last week, a very good point, of course, that I mean, we can't, journalists don't stop newspapers. You need it also that journalists didn't be sort of standoffish and snobby about this and think we're a profession and everybody else is in a trade. Sort of because it was the fact that the print unions sort of would come out and support sort of journalists fighting sort of for journalistic integrity, which gave us real power. But the print unions, which were about, Shane, Shane Garrett, he wasn't it, was the chief electrician sort of uh, on Fleet Street, sort of stopped the whole Fleet Street over, was it the mirror that did the stuff on, on, on uh, uh, maybe before your time, Nick? Was it the man you Yes, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 he was the, the, the boss man, very, very top Stalinist uh, uh, operator, sort of a say. And I got, he stopped the whole fleet street uh, over it. Journalists can't do that. So what they have to do is talk not just sort of about rebuilding sort of the NUJ at grassroots level and so on, but be re rebuilding sort of that integration sort of of workforce and a consciousness of ourselves as media workers and not sort of as a protection organisation simply for journalists within the media. It seems to me that we're not involved in that, and we, quite, we can win individual battles, of course, uh, here and there, but it's for actually changing sort of the ethical atmosphere, if I can put it like that, within the media. We have to build workers' organisations on our doomed. Um, on the day that I returned from Guantanamo Bay, I was on, on a C-130 transport aircraft, and after three years of not having read the newspaper or heard uh, the radio or seen the TV, I actually was given a whole pile of newspapers, which included The Sun, and, and for the, first, the first newspaper that I read after all these years was The Sun, uh, and that's something that I find hard to admit to, <laughs> but nonetheless, I read in there about the uh, the impending decision of the House of Lords in the case of the men being held in Belmarsh for three years, as long as I've been held in Guantanamo. And then the next day, of course, when I was with Gareth Pierce, my lawyer, she had to rush off to the Lords uh, because of this historic decision that ruled that their detention had been unconstitutional. And then after July the, the 5th, the, 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 the 5th of July? Bombings. The 7th of July bombings. Um, they were rearrested again even though they'd been released on a whole series of control orders that made uh, their lives uh, very, very difficult. So they were rearrested again and detained again for a further three years. And earlier this year, they were re re released under a series of control orders. Um, my organization, Cage Prisoners, actually did a, uh, an art <coughs> exhibition based on art that's been produced by people in this country, not Guantanamo or Vagran or any of the secret detention sites, in the United Kingdom of Great Britain, who've been detained without charge or trial on and off for the last six years, seven years. Um, and we had a, a, a relatively low response from the media because uh, they simply felt it was not relevant to talk about these issues that I think are, are very defining of Britain and how it is today. The very fact that habeas corpus, a British concept, um, has been exported successfully as a civilizing factor to the rest of the world, has been suspended in the United Kingdom again in the way that it was during internment. Um, one of the ideas, in fact, that I got for this exhibition was after the, uh, uh, going to Derry and seeing the, 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 being at the opening of the Free Derry Museum and seeing some of the things uh, that prisoners have been involved in and seeing that the fact that this is part of the process now where people can be detained in great numbers in this country or detained on the bad, rushed through anti-terror legislation it's extremely frightening, and it's even more frightening and scary for the people in the Muslim community to recognize really that the media doesn't really give a damn in its entirety. And when they do report things, and one of the examples I can give you is that I remember when uh, somebody from the, uh, the city of, of Nelson was detained under, under uh, possession of chemicals 
He was charged under the 1836 uh, Explosives Act and nothing to do with terrorism at all, even though he had lists of people that he wanted to target. And of course, this person was a, was a former, can former candidate for the BNP. And when I asked the BBC security correspondent, why did you not report this case in the manner that you have reported other Muslim terrorism cases, he said that uh, there are reporting restrictions. So that seems really strange, because it's reporting the local press. Uh, and uh, it, when I spoke to people uh, above him afterwards, he said that it doesn't fit the pattern of the sort of reporting we want out there. So that demonstrated for me clearly which direction media happens to be.